Good day everyone everywhere and special greetings to all those sitting in heavenly places in Yahshua, our Messiah. The name of this program is Cross the Border and I'm Nicholas. My website is crosstheborder.org and the reason that I call the name of this program Cross the Border is because, uh, well, I'm not greater than my master, Yahshua. Uh, some call him Jesus in the West, but he is uh, our Messiah, and I am not greater than he is. When he began his earthly ministry after being anointed, he began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom is at hand. So I bid all, everyone, everywhere to cross the border into his kingdom, that is the kingdom of heaven, or the kingdom of God, whichever way you want to put it, and obtain eternal life. It's only by entering his kingdom and remaining in his kingdom that we can obtain eternal life. If we come to the end of our mortality and we cross the threshold of mortality into the grave, because that's where mortality ends, it ends in the grave. If we are not in his kingdom when that time comes, we will not be in his kingdom forever. So as you can see, this is a very important thing. I don't believe that there is anything more important than our eternal disposition. Now, if you're not in his kingdom now, if you don't endure in his kingdom to the end of your mortality, as the scripture says, he who endures to the end shall be saved. You must endure in his kingdom until the end of your mortality. If you're not in, it's like I said, if you're not in his kingdom, when you come to the threshold of your mortality and uh, where it drops off into the grave, then you won't be in his kingdom forever. And uh, that, that'll be a sad day for you because after that, there is no redemption. Yahshua died for men. He died for living men. And that includes mankind. That includes women and children too. He didn't die for aliens. He didn't die for dead people. He redeemed the living. That's the way it works. This is your chance. The day of salvation is now. That's what it means. Now is your opportunity. Take it while you can. You may never get it again. And you may think, well, later on I can, I can get things right with God. Well, you may not be able to later on. Your heart becomes harder every day. Every day that you turn away from him. And if you turn away one more day, it may be the point of no return for you. I would be very careful. I would be afraid to turn away from our Creator and His offer of redemption through the blood of His Son, Yahshua. Uh, today, we're going to continue our trek through the Scripture. Um, what we do here most of the time is uh, we go through the Scripture and we go through it book by book, chapter by chapter, and verse by verse. And Here's where I lose most of my audience because most people don't have patience enough to go through the entire scripture. Uh, some some so-called Christians, they got a few things that they like to focus on and that's it. and They don't want to see anything else. And you know, I would say that they have a problem with their life. There's some area of disobedience, something that they don't want to give up to the Heavenly Father, some place that they will not allow the Holy Spirit to work in their life. So each of us need to examine ourselves. We need to open up our minds and our hearts to His Holy Spirit and listen and receive the convicting work of our Heavenly Father's Holy Spirit so that He can clean us up, so that He can write His law upon our heart. Because if we love breaking His law, we won't allow his law to be written on our heart. If there's something we're holding out on and the Holy Spirit is trying to zero in on it, but we're not allowing it, we're doing what is called blaspheming the Holy Spirit. We're blaspheming the work of the Holy Spirit in our life and we don't want to go there. We want to continue the work. We want to learn to live a life that is pleasing to our Heavenly Father. So we're going to continue our trek. We've uh, done the book of... Uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Joshua, uh, and numerous other books. You can go to my website and you can see links there to some of them. 
uh, you can go to the archives page on the networks and you can see uh, another link there for uh, for the archives for or podcasts uh, as they call them nowadays in the more modern era I guess <laughs> uh, you can see links there and you can see some of the studies some of the topical studies that I've done and uh, you can review any of those studies and I, I suggest to everyone that you go to my website and you start listening to Genesis and you start at the beginning and start getting it right and if you find something wrong I want to challenge everyone everywhere to listen to my studies if you think I'm in error on something you get out your uh, your e-sword and you point it out to me that is your duty as my brother in Messiah that is your duty because you're commanded we are commanded to love one another by this they will know that you are the sons of God by your love for one another so if you see me in error if you see me teaching error I need you to correct me you correct me out of the King James Version the authorized King James Version and the Texas Receptus and uh, you can get a free copy of that a wonderful tool at e hyphen sword dot net download the program and you correct me from that and I will receive your correction because I don't want to be out here teaching error uh, otherwise I'm just wasting my time I might as well go get a job or something in the world and uh, take back up the things of the world that I put off because if I'm out here teaching error then I'm doing more harm than good so don't want to go there so listen to my studies challenge me if you find some error and uh, at the same time you'll be challenging yourself as I said we've we've uh, started at the beginning of the scripture and we've gone through Exodus Genesis Leviticus uh, Deuteronomy and Joshua and what follows Joshua is judges and what happened in the wilderness is uh, Abraham oh father Abraham he was acting like a king you know he was like the Supreme Court and everything all rolled up into one and it was just uh, he was just weary to the bone it was way too much for one man to handle and I could imagine how Father Abraham felt. You had millions in the desert following him around, you know, thousands of families, and of course, 12 tribes. And every time someone had a dispute, I mean, the line was getting long outside Abraham's tent. He could hardly do anything else except judge between the people all the time. And uh, his father-in-law, that's right, Abraham had a father-in-law. His father-in-law was called the priest of Midian and I would take that to mean that his father-in-law was uh, somewhat a godly man who who reverenced uh, the Heavenly Father he must have been quite a man because our Heavenly Father sent Abraham to this man for a wife number one and uh, for training number two and also to tend sheep to tend sheep for uh, for Jethro as he's called uh, the priest of Midian in the desert there and so he was quite a man and he saw the burden that was on Abraham and he said and he called Abraham and he said hey look this is too much of a burden for you here's what you need to do well of course father Abraham says yeah you know forget God let's let's do Abraham let's do Jethro's plan no he didn't say that at all Abraham took the advice of his father or father-in-law and he set up a system of judges in Israel now uh, one of the great Bible expositors and translators when he read the government that was set up for the children of Israel in the wilderness he said he exclaimed that Israel that God had given Israel in the wilderness a government of the people by the people and for the people now most of you have heard that quote before and uh, most of you will attribute it to Abraham Lincoln and his famous document what was the name of that document uh, the uh, Emancipation Proclamation ah, but Abraham Lincoln borrowed that phrase from uh, the great Bible translator who exclaimed that when he read about the government that the Heavenly Father gave the children of Israel 
and through uh, the wisdom that he gave a man named Jethro, the father-in-law of Abraham. And they instituted that government. And that's why we have this government in Israel uh, in our historical account here in the book of Judges. Of course, this government was instituted at that point in, uh, in Israel, in the wilderness. Uh, they brought that government into the land when they crossed over the Jordan. And here we have a book that's called Judges. And that's where we're going today to the book of Judges. Uh, my good friend Henry, let's see what he has to say about this to get a little historical insight. We have here a further account of that glorious and successful campaign which Judah and Simeon made. The lot of Judah, and they are picking up, of course, from uh, where Joshua, the book of Joshua, leaves off. The lot of Judah was pretty well cleared of the Canaanites, yet not thoroughly. Those that dwelt in the mountains, the mountains were round about Jerusalem, were driven out, but, but those in the valley kept their ground against them, having chariots of iron, such as we read of, and uh, he references Joshua 17, 16. Here the men of Judah failed, and thereby spoiled the influence which otherwise their example hitherto might have had on the rest of the tribes who followed them in this instance of their cowardice rather than all the other instances of their courage. They had iron chariots and therefore it was thought not safe to attack them. But had not Israel God on their side whose chariots are thousands of angels? before whom these iron chariots would be but as stubble in the fire, had not God expressly promised by the oracle, and he refers to Judges uh, 1, chapter 1, verse 2, to give them success against the Canaanites in this very expedition without accepting those that had iron chariots? Yet they suffered their fears to prevail against their faith, they could not trust God under any disadvantage and therefore durst not face the iron chariots but mean, meanly withdrew their forces when the one bold stroke with with one bold stroke they might have completed their victories and it proved of pernicious consequences they did run well what hindered them and so that's uh, that's just the beginning so it came to pass that the children of Israel asked the Lord, saying, Who shall go up for us against the Canaanites first to fight against them? And Yahuwah said, Judah shall go up. Behold, I have delivered the land into his hand. And Judah said unto Simeon his brother, Come up with me into my lot that we may fight against the Canaanites, and I likewise will go with thee into thy lot. So Simeon went with him. And of course, we're talking about the tribes. This isn't just one singular brother to take us back to the moment in time. We're talking about the entire tribes. And of course, Simeon, the, the uh, patriarch, the great patriarch, the father of the tribe, have, and, and Judah have long been dead. And these are their, their, uh, their descendants, okay, uh, represented by tribes and the heads of the tribes. So whoever was the head of the clan, each clan still had their great patriarch and their head of that clan, or they had some kind of council where the head families would come together, uh, such as the government that our Heavenly Father gave them. And so they, they agreed together, the, the tribe of Judah and the tribe of Simeon, to go in together to uh, conquer and drive out the Canaanites in their respective territories so that they could inhabit the land that Yahuwah, the Lord their God, gave them. And Judah went up, in verse 4, and the Lord delivered the Canaanites and the Perizzites into their hand, and they slew them. In Bezek, 10,000 men. So you see, there was a, if there were 10,000 men, you know, there were an equal number of women and probably more children than that, uh, unless they were practicing their birth control and their uh, sacrifice. Uh, but uh, probably not so much in that day as in today. But eh, perhaps, you never know. Um, it was uh, one of the great sins of the ancient cultures that 
uh, walked against our Heavenly Father is, uh, is destroying their children. And, and I'm sure they did it for all the same reasons uh, that it's being done today. Okay, and they found Adonai Bezek in Bezek. And they fought against him, and they slew the Canaanite and the Perizzites. But Adonai Bezek fled, and they pursued after him, and caught him, and cut off his thumbs and his great toes. And Adonai Bezek said, Three score and ten kings, having their thumbs and their great toes cut off, gathered their meat under my table, as I have done, so God hath requited me. And they brought him to Jerusalem, and there he died. So I guess this was something that Adonai Bezak had done to other kings. And uh, he was getting his just desserts at this time uh, from, his own, from the words of his own mouth here as it's recorded. Now, uh, in verse 8, now, there, now the children of Judah had fought against Jerusalem and had taken it, and smitten with the edge of the sword, and set the city on fire. And afterward the children of Judah went down to fight against the Canaanites that dwelt in the mountain, and in the south, and in the valley. And Judah went against the Canaanites that dwelt in Hebron. Now the name of Hebron before was Kirjath Arba. And they slew Shishai and Aiman and Talmai. And from thence he went against the inhabitants of Deber, and the name of Deber before was Kirjath Sefer. Verse 12, And Caleb said, He that smiteth Kirjath Sefer, and taketh it, to him will I give Exa, my daughter, to wife. And Othniel, the son of Canaz, Caleb's younger brother, took it, and he gave him Exa, his daughter, to wife. Now, what we see demonstrated here is his, our Heavenly Father's, kingdom government for family demonstrated. Caleb was absolute, the absolute head of his family. His daughter married whomever he chose for his daughter. They did not practice the idolatry of romantic freedom. And I call it the idolatry of romance. They practice the Ten Commandments, uh, where it says, Honor your father and your mother. So we see that demonstrated here, that principle. No romance. Uh, they didn't go to public schools like they practice today and uh, being trained up in the public fool system, uh, going and watching all of the romantic uh, movies on TV, uh, if they had TV. <laughs> Uh, they did not listen to the romance of idolatry music on their radios, and that's, those were not the songs they sang, the songs of romantic idolatry, which train all of our children today. You know, perhaps these were the songs, these were the plays, these were the stories of the pagans around them, because they needed to practice the romantic idolatry, the freedom of romance the freedom, the liberty of romance. And hand in hand with that goes homosexuality. Hand in hand goes with that uh, birth control and abortion because the freedom extends to freedom from the responsibility that our Heavenly Father gave us, the wonderful communion of a man and woman in marriage for. Okay, here's our break. Uh, we'll be back. In a few minutes, don't go anywhere. You're listening to Cross the Border. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on Internet or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, 
we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for Missionary Radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. Then, when you subscribe, we will send you the last quarterly MP3 CD of that program immediately and continue to do so with each new quarter. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host, cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator, for His holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening. You're listening to Cross the Border. We're going through, uh, we just began our study in the book of Judges. And we got to uh, Caleb said, He that smiteth Kirjath Sefer and taketh it, to him I will give Aksa, my daughter to wife. And Oth Neil, the son of Canaz, Caleb's younger brother, took it. And he gave him Aksa, his daughter to wife. And it came to pass when she came to him that she moved him to ask of her father a field and she lighted off from her ass and Caleb said unto her, What wilt thou? And she said to him, Give me a blessing for thou hast given me a south land. Give me also springs of water. And Caleb gave her the upper springs and the nether springs and the children of... <coughs> Of the Kenite, Moses' father-in-law, went up out of the city of the palm trees with the children of Judah into the wilderness of Judah, which lieth in the south of Arad, and they went and dwelt among the people. And Judah went with Simeon, his brother, and they slew the Canaanites that inhabited Zephath and utterly destroyed it, and the name of the city was called Hormah. Also Judah took... Gaza with the coast thereof, and Ascalon with the coast thereof, and Akron with the coast thereof, and Yahuwah, the Lord, was with Judah, and he drove out the inhabitants of the mountain, but could not drive out the inhabitants of the valley, because they had chariots of iron. And they gave Hebron unto Caleb, as Moses had said, and he expelled thence three sons the three sons of Anak. And the children of Benjamin did not drive out the Jebusites that inhabited Jerusalem. But the Jebusites dwell with the children of Benjamin in Jerusalem unto this day. And the house of Joseph, they also went up against Bethel. And Yahuwah was with them, and the house of Joseph sent to descry Bethel. Now the name of the city before was Luz. And the spies saw a man come forth out of the city, and they said unto him, Show us, we pray thee, the entrance into the city, and we shall show thee mercy. And when he showed them the entrance into the city, they smote the city with the edge of the sword, but they let go the man and all his family. And the man went into the land of the Hittites, and built a city, and called the name thereof Luz, which is the name thereof to this day. Neither did Manasseh drive out the inhabitants of Beth Sheen and her towns, nor Tanakh and her towns, 
nor the inhabitants of Dor and her towns, nor the inhabitants of Iblim and her towns, nor the inhabitants of Megiddo and her towns, but the Canaanites would dwell in that land. And what do we have going on here? Of course, the Heavenly Father, he, they were instructed, the, the 12 tribes uh, were instructed to go across and drive out all the inhabitants of the land. But it's a hard thing to do for a man to wield the sword of God by command. And uh, this is demonstrated uh, so clearly by the Israelites because they had to stand before these men. It was easier to live in peace with them. To, to, so to carry out the judgment of God by the sword was not an easy thing for these people to do. It was easier to compromise. It's easier to live with other men in peace. But the problem was that they were commanded to do it. And because they were commanded to do it and they did not obey the command, uh, all of these men became, all of these men and their people became a snare to the children of Israel. And uh, as we shall see, that's the problem with allowing just anybody into your land. And we see that's uh, exactly what's happening with America. Uh, that's a problem with evangelism or evangelicalism in the church. When the church uh, has morphed from being Protestant or Protestants into being evangelical and ecumenical, we see that the pagans that come into the congregations uh, bring all of their pollutions of idols and pollute the body of Christ. Uh, so the same problem, same thing happening. Because really, when you think about it, what we had is we had the body of our Creator as we think of the body of Christ today or the church. Well, this was the church in the wilderness. This was the church coming into the promised land. And they were to drive out all the inhabitants. They were to rout out all of the pagans with all of their idolatry before them. But it was easier for them to live in peace rather than go to war, even though the Heavenly Father promised them victory. But they succumb to fear instead. And the fear of those that they had fear with, or they succumb to uh, having the desire rather to live at peace. What was easier? And that was to make peace with the inhabitants and allow them to live there in peace. Of course, the problem being their practice of idolatry, their practice of fertility and goddess worship. And as I said before, all of these abominations led to uh, further abominations such as homosexuality, uh, the goddess worship, and uh, the worship of the form, uh, rather, and romance, the idolatry of romance leads to, uh, finally, to birth control and killing your uh, unborn and your born children, sacrificing them to these idols. Because after all, that's what liberty is all about. And liberty, when liberty becomes your idol, when liberty becomes your highest uh, ideal, then that liberty extends to your freedom from burden. And especially the burden that comes with procreation or the act of procreating, because our Heavenly Father, uh, He created the act. He made it wonderful uh, for us, for His people, for, for His creation, uh, for mankind, so that they could enjoy the act of procreating. He made it very enjoyable. He made it for the purpose so that people would engage in it, because if it wasn't enjoyable, if it wasn't pleasurable, nobody would do it, and the human race would die out. People would have to, on purpose, go do something that wasn't enjoyable, wasn't pleasant. And uh, so you see how, how wise our Creator was in making the act of procreation an enjoyable thing for mankind. But it turns out that mankind just wants the enjoyment, but they are disobedient, is that they don't want the result the thing that our, fa our Heavenly Father made the enjoyment for to make it as e easy for us to be obedient 
to his command when he said, be fruitful and multiply. He didn't just command us to do something unpleasant. He made it pleasant to do. So we're disobedient when we just want to enjoy it, and then we kill our offspring or practice birth control that is disobedience to our Creator, and we find ourselves worshiping the creation rather than the Creator. And we can see this has been going on uh, since, you know, since the beginning of time, basically, uh, when you have your report in the, in the uh, Scripture that the sons of God, and those were not uh, angels, but those were the sons of God, uh, saw the women uh, took themselves wives and what they actually started to do was they started to look on the form of women and there began the idolatry of the form, idolatry of uh, the creation rather than obedience to the creator and if you want to uh, more information on that you can go back to my Genesis study and look into that and uh, don't believe all this nonsense about angels and stuff because there's nothing, absolutely nothing in the scripture that backs up that line of thinking. Although it's uh, become very popular because I guess people like to hear stuff like that that's exciting and so forth. But we're here to study the word and what it actually says, what it reveals to us and not what we could imagine to be exciting out of it. Okay, so we continue here in, uh, in Judges and uh, their conquest of the land after Joshua. They continue their conquest of the land after Joshua passes on. And, of course, Caleb is left. Uh, Caleb was one of the men that uh, was in the wilderness 40 years before they entered the land. So uh, Caleb's a fairly old man here uh, now after Joshua dies. Okay, where did we leave off here? Oh, yes. Neither did Manasseh drive out the inhabitants of Bethshem and her towns, nor Tanakh and her towns, and the inhabitants of Dor and her towns, nor the inhabitants of Iblim and her towns, nor the inhabitants of Megiddo. Yes, we read that. We got to that. And it came to pass when Israel was strong that they put the Canaanites to tribute. Well, they weren't to put them to tribute. And they did not utterly drive them out. Neither did Ephraim drive out the Canaanites that dwell in Gezer. But the Canaanites dwelt in Gezer among them. Neither did Zebulun drive out the inhabitants of Kitron, nor the inhabitants of Nahalal. But the Canaanites dwelt among them and became tributaries. Neither did Asher drive out the inhabitants of Echo, nor the inhabitants of Zidon, nor, the, nor of e Elab, nor of Akzib, nor of Helba, nor of Aphik, nor of Rehob, but the Asherites dwelt among the Canaanites, the inhabitants of the land, for they did not drive them out. Neither did Naphtali drive out the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh, nor the inhabitants of Beth Anath, but he, dwelt, but he dwelt among the Canaanites, the inhabitants of the land. Nevertheless, the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh and of Beth Anath became tributaries unto them. And tributaries, that means that they paid tribute, they paid taxes, they paid protection fees. We will pay you if you let us live here in peace, basically. So... What we have here is the children of Israel running a protection racket, basically. Uh, I don't recall that the Heavenly Father said, Go into the land and uh, you know, start a protection racket. Take money from the people, and if they don't pay you, then kill them. Nah, I don't remember that at all. But, well, that's... Uh, it was easier. They were moving into the land. They were staking out their plots. They were planting their vineyards and raising their families. And they didn't want to bother with war anymore. They didn't want to go off and utterly drive out, you know, and, and kill people. And, you know, all that bloody mess that goes with war. Just a big bother, right? Who wants to do that? We'd rather live in peace. Yes. 
We would rather live in peace. Yes, bring them all into the church. Ah, so what? A little pollution is of idols in our land. Who cares? You know, we can live in peace. We, it won't touch us. It won't touch us. You could imagine them saying these things, just like today in all the corporate churches. And now they're practicing all the idolatry. You know, Christ's death, Christmas from pagan Babylon and uh, from the mother church, the mother whore church, and then Ashtaroth, Easter, they practice that every year, and at the same time they ignore, you know, the Heavenly Father's holy days. Oh, you know, we don't have to do the Heavenly Father's holy days. Let's practice all these pagan stuff instead. Yes, let's have an Easter egg roll on the, on the lawn of the White House. <laughs> yes, what fun. Yes, it, won't, it won't come near us. And the Amorites forced the children of Dan into the mountain, for they would not suffer them to come down to the valley. But the Amorites would dwell in the Mount Haris, and Ai Jalan, and in Shealbim. Yet the hand of the house of Joseph prevailed, so that they became tributaries. And the coast of the Amorites was from the going up to Akrabim from the rock and upward. Chapter 2 of Judges and verse 1. And an angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bochim and said, I made you go up out of Egypt and brought you into the land which I swore to your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. And you shall make no league with the inhabitants of this land. You shall throw down their altars, but you have not obeyed my voice. Why have you done this? Now I want you to, I want you to notice something here. <clears throat> the Heavenly Father, Yahuwah, it says, and the angel of the Lord, the messenger of Yahuwah, our creator, their creator, he came up and he says this to them. He said, I will never break my covenant with you. Now a lot of people latch onto that and say that God is still bound to keep his covenant with the Jews and the Jews are God's chosen people today still and he's bound because he said I will never break my covenant with you but you know a covenant the covenant works two ways he said if you do not I will not he didn't break the covenant they did and that's what's being proclaimed here they have broken the covenant so we need to pay attention and you shall make no league with the inhabitants of the land. Yes, if you, if you say, you know, if you pay us money, if you give us of your, the fruit of your labor, we will not kill you. It, we, we, you know, if you set up a protection racket, tribute, tribute, tributary with them, you make a league with them. He says, you shall make no league with the inhabitants of the land. You shall throw down their altars, but you have not obeyed my voice. Why have you done this? Wherefore, I also said, I will not drive them out from before you, but they shall be as thorns in your sides, and their gods shall be a snare unto you. And it came to pass, when the angel of Yahuwah spoke these words unto all the children of Israel, that the people lifted up their voices and wept. And they called the name of that place Bochim, and they sacrificed there unto Yahuwah, the Lord. And when Joshua had let the people go, the children of Israel went, every man, to his inheritance to possess the land. And the people served Yahuwah all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders that outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great works of Yahuwah, of the Lord, that he did for Israel. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died, being a hundred and ten years old. And they buried him in the border of his inheritance in Tim Nath Haris, in the Mount of Ephraim, on the north side of the hill of Gaash. And also all that generation were gathered unto their fathers, and there arose another generation after them, which knew not Yahuwah. They didn't know him, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. And the children of Israel did evil, in the sight of the Lord, and served Baalim, or Baal. And they forsook the Lord God of their fathers, which brought them out of the land of Egypt. 
and followed other gods. See, these all these gods did become a snare to them. The gods of the people that were round about them and bowed themselves down unto them and provoked Yahuwah to anger. You know, I see the same thing happening in the land where I live. We have America rose up in the wilderness, a new and a mighty nation and the second beast of the book of Revelation having risen up lamb-like. Ah, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. And if all men are created equal, that means that I have to do unto my neighbor as I would have him do unto me. That is, that is a beautiful lamb-like principle for the founding of this nation. But what happens? Well, you have two horns. The first horn, lamb-like. The second one, dragon-like. We see that America falls. They start allowing all of the idols and all of the religions and all of the nations of the world just to pour into their borders and bring their cultures and their gods and their worship and their, their false idols. And then on top of that, the churches accommodate them with their evangelicalism uh, and their ecumenism. And they bring them in. And they bring in all the pagan idolatry, all of the romance and all of the, the idolatry of romance, the idolatry of uh, fertility worship. It, it is all in the church now. And this is exactly... What is ha it just history just keeps repeating itself over and over again. It seems that no one can read or understand, hey, they did this. If we do it, perhaps we'll get a re different result. No, the same result. You do the same thing, you get the same result. You keep repeating the same thing and the same thing keeps happening. Uh, you think you'd kind of get the idea. But all of these things are recorded here for an example to us. We need to separate ourselves from the world. At least we need to secede from the world on an individual or a familial level if we're able. But, our, but you know, Yahshua did say, he said, I have come to set a man at variance against his father. And what he was exclaiming there is what would happen when men turned and accepted the Messiah in a family, that it would separate very families. So we shouldn't be surprised when we look around us and when we read Judges, we read these words and see that it happened there as it's happening here. So they forsook the Lord their God, the God of their fathers, which brought them out of the land of Egypt. And they provoked Yahuwah, the Lord, to anger. And we've come to the end of this hour. So we'll pick up here when we come back. You've been listening to Cross the Border. Uh, join me after the break here and stay tuned for the news. The book of Revelation says, the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus Christ. This is at the very heart of FirstAmendmentRadio.com. In that spirit, we have created the Prophecy Reality News app for all of your mobile devices. Streaming First Amendment Radio 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Available for your Apple, Android device, and smartphone absolutely free. Get the Prophecy Reality News app installed today so you can listen to First Amendment Radio wherever you are. The Prophecy Reality News app. Get it now. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, -S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. When it comes to prophecy today, much of the evangelical Christian world has their eyes on Israel, waiting and watching to see when the third temple will begin to be built. The plans are drawn. The Jewish people are eager. Most evangelical Christians today believe that the rapture will happen before the third temple is built. Hi, I'm Michael Eugene. I was taught that Daniel's 70th week was in the future. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Have we searched the scriptures and found this to be true? Why is it so important for a reestablished Israel to build a third temple in Jerusalem? Is it necessary to build a temple 
on the same location already occupied by the Dome of the Rock? Is it necessary for sacrifices to take place in the temple on Temple Mount? Is there really a rapture followed by seven years of tribulation? What is the New Testament temple? Can we identify history and prophecy? Who is the first beast in Revelation chapter 13? Who are the seven kings in Revelation 17? I have asked all these questions and I have found Nicholas Arthur's new book, When the Third Temple is Built, answers all these questions and more using scripture to interpret scripture. The Bible says that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. Nicholas shows us in his new book, When the Third Temple is Built, how the Bible interprets prophecy and not man's private interpretation. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. Listening to Cross the Border, I'm Nicholas, and we're uh, continuing our study here in uh, in the Book of Judges. We've got to all the way to chapter two, uh, about verse twelve, where it says, "The children of Israel, and they forsook the Lord God of their fathers, which brought them out of the land of Egypt, and followed other gods, of the gods of the people that were round about them, and bowed themselves unto them." and provoked Yahuwah to anger, and they forsook the Lord, and served Baal and Ashtaroth. How many of you have uh, bowed yourself in the last week to Ashtaroth? Ah, yes, Ashtaroth. How many of you went to, uh, to church on Ashtaroth Sunday? And, uh, oh, I'm, I'm sure that they Christianized it. And how many of you bought for your children candy in baskets, colored eggs and chocolate bunnies and chocolate eggs and and things like that? How many of you celebrated uh, the fertility goddess Ashtaroth, also called Easter today? How many? Spring. Ah, what a wonderful time of year. Everything is reproducing in the spring all things become new and spring to life in the spring oh ashtaroth ashtaroth is that what's going on here and how many of you had a sunrise service yes the the sun rising worshiping the goddess ashtaroth the matrix from where all things come yes the matrix the womb of the woman the goddess worship. How many of you took part in that? How many of you were bribed as children with candy and baskets into serving a false god? Into allowing the pollution of idol into your life? And then you think, oh, well, I enjoyed it when I was a child. Well, yeah, what child doesn't enjoy baskets full of candy? Come on, you're being bribed into idolatry. And it's the same with thing with Christmas, the, the Babylonian pagan Christ death celebration. Uh, it's the same thing. You're being bribed with gifts and candy. And of course, Halloween, the same thing. They love to bribe the children with candy and gifts into their idolatry, into the I, pagan idolatry, into the pollutions of idols. And that way they 
just accept oh it's such a wonderful thing you know uh, they may even make a law where if you don't allow your children to participate in these things it could be considered child abuse you have to prove oh i'm a good parent oh we celebrated christmas and easter and and Halloween, uh, like to deprive your children of the candy and gifts and all of these things. Oh no, they're so much fun. How could you deprive your children of that? After all, I got all these things when I was a child. So the, we just carry on these stupid traditions, not understanding, not caring. Eh, no, God don't care. I'm not under the law. God doesn't care. God wouldn't want my children deprived of, you know, chocolate bunnies and baskets. And how about the Easter egg hunt on the, you know, we got to watch that every year on the TV. The Easter egg hunt on the, they have the, on the lawn of the White House. Yes, let's bring the, let's bring the idolatry right into the top of the government. They forsook. Yahuwah, they forsook the God of their fathers and served, Judges chapter 2, verse 13, and served Baal and Ashtaroth. You know, the parallels are just astounding. Easter, come on. The only place Easter is mentioned once in the scripture, and it's not mentioned as a Christian holiday. It's mentioned as a pagan holiday. That's right. And it was sort of mentioned as around the time of Passover. Actually, it was mentioned as during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Well, that's, that's right. That's the way it happened this year during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. They had Easter Sunday. So they forsook. And how many of us are guilty? How many of us are willing to throw it off? Most of us won't. Most of you won't. Because, you know, what would your family think if you show up next Easter? Easter, next Ashtaroth Sunday, and you say, can't do baskets. You know what? Last Sunday, when the world was celebrating Ashtaroth with eggs and bunnies and little baskets and chocolate eggs and candy and jelly beans and all of those things, you know what we did at my house? None of that. Yeah, and I have children. We did none of that here. As a matter of fact, the word Easter was not even mentioned on that day. I did recognize Passover and Passover, though we didn't sacrifice a lamb, you know, but I might do that some year. I would rather do that because there's nothing wrong with doing that. Uh, that that's the celebration, the Passover. That's the celebration of when the angel of death passed over the children of Israel a notable miracle, and all the firstborn of Egypt were slain from all cattle, from the firstborn of the king of Egypt, uh, to the, from the pharaoh, to the least, to the servant, to all their cattle, to everything that was firstborn of the males was slain in Egypt. Was it just the males? No. And that's why he said to the children of Israel, all the firstborn of mine, they're all dedicated to me because I saved their lives. I passed over. And that's, you know, that's what we should be observing if we, call him, if we call ourselves his people, if we are called by his name, the people of Yahuwah. Yeah, if we're called by his name, if we call ourselves his people. You know, in the scripture, there's a scripture in the, uh, in the book of Revelation, and it says, Beware of them who call themselves Jews but are not. You know, that's a funny rendering. And that's a mistaken rendering, too. And I've thought about that, and I've looked into it. And, I, and here's what I came up with. If I were translating that into Hebrew, it would say something like this. Beware, if I were to translate it into Hebrew and directly from the Hebrew into English, it would say something like this. Beware of them who call themselves the people of God, but are not. That's really what it says. That's really what the message is. Because the book of Revelation was not written to the Jews. It was written to, to the people of God. The people of our Creator. That's right. It was written to them. And it was a beware of people who call themselves the people of God but are not. Now that makes a little more sense, doesn't it? But we're getting far afield of our uh, 
but they're the ones who bring in a lot of this idolatry, all of this evangelicalism that's overtaken the church, where you have a church that embraces and brings the world in rather than separates from the world and becomes a light. Now they don't become a light to the world. They go, we are the world. Look, we're celebrating Ashtaroth. Bring your little baskets to church. You know, and they have the eggs and the baskets. And, and, and then for an excuse, they call it uh, the day that Christ rose from the dead. As if, uh, as if somehow fertility and goddess worship is responsible for Christ rising from the dead. So we're going to bring Ashtaroth in it. And we're going to call it Ashtaroth or Easter Sunday. And some now call it Resurrection Sunday or whatever. But, you know, I say, well, you could, that's fine. You can celebrate the resurrection any day you want. But leave Ashtaroth out of it. Leave Easter out of it. Leave the eggs and the bunnies out of it. And let's celebrate the resurrection every day. And if we're going to have feast days, why don't we do his feast days? Why don't we keep his calendar instead of all these pagan things that were brought in by those who call themselves the people of God but are not? Beware of them. And so we have here in Judges, it's recorded for us that uh, the, the children of Israel, the people of God on earth, the people called by his name, are allowing now all of the pollutions of idols to come into the congregation. They allow them to stay there and they start to embrace them. They start to visit them and have start to marry with them and so forth and it goes on and on but let's continue let's jump back in here in uh, verse 14 of judges chapter 2 and the anger of yahuwah the anger of the lord was hot against israel and he delivered them into the hands of spoilers that spoiled them and he sold them into the hands of their enemies round about so that they could not any longer stand before their enemies and that's what happens. See, you allow your enemies to come in and they plot against you. You know why? Because they're not godly. They're not honest. They may pretend that they're all about goodness. Like CPS today and all the government out there. Oh, it just it's all for the good of the people. But they're your enemies. They're plotting against you because they serve other gods. They don't serve the truth. They serve the father of lies. They worship the dragon. That's what the scripture says. Same thing here in the land of Israel, in the promised land where they allow those that worship the dragon to stay in there with all of their idolatries and pollute their congregations and their families and their people. So they plotted against them while they pretended to be their friends. That's, that's what those who worship the dragon do. You may think, oh, we can give a little. We can, we can compromise a little just to be at peace but while they're plotting your destruction because they do not love their neighbor as themselves. They do not do unto others as you would, as they, they do not embrace the law of our Heavenly Father. Their law says take whatever you can. Use whatever device you can to spoil your neighbor. Get whatever you can for yourself because, you know, eat, drink, and be merry because tomorrow we die. Yes, that's right. We just go to the grave and that's it because we don't want to serve a God. We don't, want to, we don't believe in the resurrection of the dead. We live without faith so that all we have is whatever we can get in this life even if we have to take it from others. That's the way they live. You can never trust those that worship the dragon, that do not follow the commandments that do not embrace the commandments of our Heavenly Father and desire to live a life that is pleasing to Him because they have not been redeemed. Neither do they seek to be redeemed. They worship the creation rather than the Creator. Whithersoever they went out, the hand of Yahuwah was against them for evil, as the Lord had said, and as the Lord had sworn unto them, and they were greatly distressed. Nevertheless, the Lord raised up judges which delivered them out of the hands of those that spoiled them. And yet they would not hearken unto their judges, but they went a-whoring 
after other gods and bowed themselves down unto them. You know, that's like me sitting here telling you, cut it off. Cut off the Ashtaroth. Cut off the Christ's death. Cut off the, all of these pollutions of idols. Cut it all off. Stop taking the benefits of the world system. Start looking to our Heavenly Father for His benefits. Cut off the social security numbers. Cut off the insurance. Cut off all these things that are against His law. And turn to Him. But the people wouldn't listen. And the people do not listen. Very few will listen. Very few love the truth. Very few. They have their excuse. What have they embraced in the corporate church? We're not under the law, we're under the grace. So what, we can sin? So we can ignore God's law? We can practice idolatry? We don't have to keep his feast days? But let's keep these other pagan feast days instead. You know, somehow, that makes a lot of sense, doesn't it, huh? <laughs> Does it make any sense? Does it make any sense at all? We're free from God's law so we can practice idolatry? That makes sense to you? I think the Heavenly Father says the same thing to you that he said to the children of Israel that's recorded in Judges. He says, Nevertheless, the Lord raised up judges which delivered them out of the hands of those that spoiled them, and yet they would not hearken unto their judges. So there were godly men going, Hey, cast down the idols. Come out of them. Throw them off. Conquer them. Drive them out. But they would not hearken. And they went a-whoring after the other gods and bowed themselves unto them and turned quickly out of the way which their fathers walked in, obeying the commandments of Yahuwah. And they did not so. And when the Lord raised them up judges, then the Lord was with the judge and delivered them out of the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge, for it repented the Lord because of their groaning by reason of them that oppressed and vexed them. And it came to pass when the judge was dead that they returned and corrupted themselves more than their fathers in following other gods to serve them and to bow down unto them. They ceased not from their own doings nor from their stubborn way. And the anger of Yahuwah, the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. And he said, because that this people hath transgressed my covenant, which I commanded their fathers, and have not hearkened unto my voice, I also will not henceforth drive out any from before them of the nations which Joshua left when he died, that through them I may prove Israel, whether they will keep the way of Yahuwah to walk therein, as their, as their fathers did keep it, or not. What will you do? Here, we have the pagans all around us. We have their idolatry all around us. We have the pollutions of idols in the corporate church. We have the benefits of the world supplanting the benefits of our Heavenly Father. We have promises from the world that seem greater because they satisfy now. They take care of our fears. Oh, what am I going to do when I get 65? Who's going to take care of me? God can't do it. We can't trust God to take care of us. Oh, great government. Oh, great government. Uncle Sam, take, identify me as one of yours. I will fill out the form for benefits. Give me a number. I will be one of yours and I will serve you. That's right. And anytime you, you say jump, I'll say how high. You say fill out the form, master, and I will report everything to you. Because a slave reports to his master when the master says report. How many of you are preparing your 1040 inquisition forms for your master right now as I speak? How many of you are rushing down before midnight on April Fool's Day? Uh, it's not April 1st, it's April 15th in the land where I live. How many of you are rushing down there to report to your master on your 1040 inquisition form? Master, master, I'm reporting. Master always reports to his slave. I report to my heavenly father. When his Holy Spirit convicts me, I repent. And I say, please, heavenly father, write your law upon my heart. You know, the masters of this world and the masters of this mortal existence, they have nothing. Sure, they'll give you four, five, six hundred dollars a month when you turn 65. 
till the day you die. That's your retirement. That's your reward. But our Heavenly Father has a reward that never ends. What kind of reward is that that the world gives you? You're 65. You're wore out. They've, they've thoroughly destroyed your health the best they can. You've served, other, you served idols all your life. And all you put money, mammon, ahead of everything else. Otherwise, you just bought into the whole thing. And you get old, and then you're going to die in a few years because now you're retired. you got nothing to do. And you're tired. And your body's wore out. What kind of deal is that? You know, I like my Heavenly Father's retirement plan better. I will serve Him until the day I die. Oh yes, I will serve because of my physical, diminished physical capacity as I get older. I will serve Him less in a less capacity, at least physically. But he understands that. And he says he'll take care of me. He says, seek first my kingdom, not seek first your retirement. Uh, and, and who's going to give you money when you get old? And he said, seek first my kingdom, and I will provide everything that you need. And then he says, when, then when I retire you, if you, if, you, uh, if you endure in my kingdom to the end of your mortal existence, I have a reward that will never end. And guess what? Your retirement will not be in a decrepit body for a few years that you have left. I will give you a new body, he says. That's his promise. You will raise from the dead like Yahshua did and showed himself to thousands. You will have a body that will never get sick. It will never get crippled. And if you were crippled or you were sick or you had diminished capacity, you will be restored to the state for which he created mankind. And that is beyond what anybody is experiencing today. Perhaps the only man that really ever experienced that was Adam and Eve. Could you imagine a man have it using 100% of his brain capacity? Having total recall? Having that kind of power? Power unexplored? Hmm. And better than that. He promises more than most men can imagine. His retirement plan. That's the one that I've signed up for. So I will listen to his Holy Spirit and I will confess my sins to him. And all these other gods out here, not my master. This is the land of the free and the home of the brave where I have freedom to practice my religion, at least by their law. And we'll see, uh, I will do that as much as I can. And that means throwing off all of the voluntary things that I volunteered into at one time and repenting of all of those things that are against the law of my Heavenly Father and coming out of his world system. Because here it is. The anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. And he says, I'm going to not drive out these idolaters among you that I may prove Israel. He's proving us now on an individual basis. When he proves you, what does he find? That's the question. Each one of us individually are going to stand before him. And we stand before him now. And if we don't acknowledge him now, we will acknowledge him later. Don't ever doubt it. We'll be back in a few minutes. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on Internet or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for missionary radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. 
Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. Then, when you subscribe, we will send you the last quarterly MP3 CD of that program immediately and continue to do so with each new quarter. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host, cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator, for His holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening. Judges, chapter 2 and verse 22, that through them I may prove Israel, whether they will keep the way of the Lord, to walk therein, as their fathers did, keep it, or not. Therefore the Lord left those nations without driving them out hastily, neither delivered he them into the hand of Joshua, chapter 3 of Judges. Now these are the nations which Yahuwah left to prove Israel by them, even as many of Israel had not known all the wars of Canaan, only that the generations of the children of Israel might know to teach them war, and at least such as before knew nothing thereof, namely five lords of the Philistines, and all the Canaanites and the Sidonians, and the Hivites that dwelt in the Mount Lebanon, from Mount baal Herman unto the entering in of Hamath. And they were to prove Israel by them, to know whether they would hearken unto the commandments of the Lord, which he commanded their fathers by the hand of Moses. And the children of Israel dwelt among the Canaanites, the Hivites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, and they took their daughters to be their wives, and gave, oh, gave their daughters to their sons, and served their gods. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of Yahuwah, and forgot the Lord their God, and served Baalim and the groves. Therefore the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he sold them into the hind, the hand of the of Cushan Rish Athiam king of Mesopotamia, and the ch children of Israel served Cushan rish Ethaim eight years. And when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, Yahuwah raised up a deliverer to the children of Israel who delivered them, Oth Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he judged Israel and went out to war. And the Lord delivered Cush, Cushan Rishathaim, king of Mesopotamia, into his hand, and his hand prevailed against Cushan Rishathaim. And the land had rest forty years. And Othniel, the son of Canaz, died. And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord strengthened Eglon, king of Moab, against Israel because they had done evil in the sight of the Lord. And he gathered unto him the children of Ammon and Amalek, and went and smote Israel, and possessed the city of palm trees. So the children of Israel served Aglon, the king of Moab, eighteen years. And when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, the Lord raised them up, a deliverer, Ehud, the son of Gerah, a Benjamite, a man left-handed, and by him the children of Israel sent a present to Eglon, the king of Moab. But Ehud made him a dagger which had two edges, 
of a cubit length, and he did gird it under his raiment upon his right thigh. And he brought the present unto Eglon the king of Moab, and Eglon was a very fat man. And when he had made an end to offer the present, he sent away the people that bore the present. But he himself turned again from the quarries that were by Gilgal, and said, I have a secret errand unto thee, O king, who said, Keep silence, and all that stood by him went out from him. And Ehud came unto him, and he was sitting in a summer parlor, which he had for himself alone. And Ehud said, I have a message from God unto thee. And he arose out of his seat, and he who had put forth his left hand, and took the dagger from his right thigh, and thrust it into his belly. And the haft also went in after the blade, and the fat closed upon the blade, so that he could not draw the dagger out of his belly, and the dirt came out. And Ehud went forth through the porch, and shut the doors of the parlor upon him, and locked them. When he was gone out, his servants came, and when they saw that, behold, the doors of the parlor were locked, they said, Surely he covereth his feet in his summer chamber. And they tarried till they were ashamed, and behold, he opened not the doors of the parlor. Thereof they took a key and opened it, and behold, their Lord fallen down dead on the earth. And Ehud escaped while they tarried, and passed beyond the quarries, and escaped into Seirath. And it came to pass when he was come that he blew the trumpet in the mountains of Ephraim. And the children of Israel went down with him from the mount, and he before them, and he said unto them, Follow after me, for the Lord has delivered your enemies, the Moabites, into your hand. And they went down after him, and took the fords of Jordan toward Moab, and suffered not a man to pass over. And they slew of Moab at that time about ten thousand men, all lusty, and all men of valor, and there escaped not a man. So Moab was subdued that day under the hand of Israel, and the land had rest four score years. And that would be eighty years for all of you that are public schooled. And after him was Shamgar, and the son of Anath, which slew out of the Philistines six hundred men with an ox goad, and he also delivered Israel. And the children of Israel again, again and again and again, <laughs> again did evil in the sight of Yahuwah when Ehud was dead. So the Heavenly Father would raise up a man of valor, he would go in and slay and and conquer their enemies, and they would praise God for a little while. But as soon as the man died, well, they went off and, you know, did evil again, unfortunately. And the Lord sold them into the hand of Jaban, Jabin, king of Canaan, that reigned in Hazor, the captain of whose host was Sisera, which well in Harasheth of the Gentiles. And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, for he had nine hundred chariots of iron, and twenty years he mightily oppressed the children of Israel. And Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, she judged Israel at that time. And she dwelt under the palm tree of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in Mount Ephraim, and the children of Israel came up to her for judgment. And she sent and called Barak. And she sent and called Barak, the son of Abinoam, out of Kadesh Naphtali, and said unto him, Hath not Yahuwah, God of Israel, commanded, saying, Go and draw toward Mount Tabor, and take with thee ten thousand men of the children of Naphtali and the children of Zebulun? And I will draw unto thee to the river of Kishon. Sisera, the captain of Jabin's army, and with his chariots and his multitude, and I will deliver them into thine hand. And Barak said unto her, If thou wilt go with me, then I will go. But if thou wilt not go with me, I will not go. And she said, I will surely go with thee, notwithstanding the journey thou takest shall not be for thine honor. 
for the Lord shall sell Caesarea into the hand of a woman. And Deborah arose and went with Barak to Kadesh. And Barak called Zebulun and Naphtali to Kadesh, and he went up with ten thousand men at his feet. And Deborah went up with him. Now Haber the Kenite, which was of the children of Hobab, the father-in-law of Moses, he came up with Hobab, the father-in-law of Moses, and severed himself from the Kenites and pitched his tent into the plain of Zaanaim, which is by Kadesh. And they showed Sisera that Barak, son of Abin Oam, was gone up to Mount Tabor. And Sisera gathered together all his chariots, even nine hundred chariots of iron, and all the people that were with him, from Harosheh of the Gentiles unto the river Kishon. And Deborah said to Barak, Up, for this day in which the Lord hath delivered Sisera into thy hand, is not the Lord gone out before thee? So Barak went down from Mount Tabor and 10,000 men after him. And Yahuwah discomfited Sisera and all, char all his chariots and all his hosts with the edge of the sword before Barak, so that Sisera lighted down off his chariot and fled away, fled away on his feet. But Barak pursued after the chariots and after the hosts unto Herosheth of the Gentiles, and all the hosts of Sisera fell upon the edge of the sword, and there was not a man left. Howbeit Sisera fled away on his feet to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber, the Kenite, for there was peace between Jabin, the king of Hazor, the house of Heber, and the Kenite. And Jael went out to meet Sisera, and said unto him, Turn in, my lord, Turn into me, fear not. And when he had turned in unto her into the tent, she covered him with a mantle. And he said unto her, Give me, I pray thee, a little water to drink, for I am thirsty. And she opened a bottle of milk and gave him drink, and covered him. And again he said unto her, Stand in the door of the tent, and it shall be when any man doth come to inquire of thee, and say, Is there any man in here? Thou shalt say, No. Then Jael, Heber's wife, took a nail of the tent and took a hammer in her hand and went softly unto him and smote the nail into his temples and fastened it to the ground, for he was fast asleep and weary, so he died. And behold, as Barak pursued Sisera, Jael came out to meet him and said unto him, Come, and I will show thee the man whom thou seekest. And when he came into her tent, behold, Sisera lay dead, and the nail was in his temple. So God subdued that day Jabin, the king of Canaan, before the children of Israel. And the hand of the children of Israel prospered and prevailed against Jabin, the king of Canaan, until they had destroyed Jabin, king of Canaan. Then sang Deborah and Barak, the son Abinoam, on that day, saying, Praise ye, Yahuwah, for avenging, for the avenging of Israel, when the people willingly offered themselves. Hear, O ye kings, give ear, O ye princes, I, even I, will sing unto Yahuwah, of course, the Lord in the authorized King James Version, I will sing praises unto Yahuwah, God of Israel. Yahuwah, when thou wentest out of Seir, then when thou marchest out of the field of Edom, and the earth trembled, and the heavens dropped, and the clouds also dropped water, the mountains melted before, from before Yahuwah, even that Sinai, from before Yahuwah, God of Israel, in the days of Shamgar, the son of Anath, in the days of Jael, the highways were unoccupied, and the travelers walked through byways. The villages ceased, they ceased in Israel, until that I, Deborah, arose, and I arose, a mother in Israel. They chose new gods. Then was war in the gates. Was there a shield or a spear seen 
among 40,000 in Israel, my heart toward the governors of Israel that offered themselves willingly among the people. Bless ye, Yahuwah. Speak ye that ride on white asses, ye that sit in judgment and walk by the way. And of course this is Deborah singing this song, and I'll bet ya any amount of money, just use your own judgment, that she did not say the Lord, as it's reported in the King James Version, but as it's reported in the Texas Receptus, that is the received text, the name of the Creator is what she was singing. And so I will say it in the best phonetically as I can understand it as I read her song. And I don't know anyone who's put it to music yet, but perhaps someone should. Uh, so I'll continue. And they that are delivered from the noise of the archers and the places of the drawing of drawing water, there shall they rehearse the righteous acts of Yahuwah, even the righteous acts toward the inhabitants of his villages in Israel. Then shall the people of Yahuwah go down to the gates. Awake, awake, Deborah, awake, awake. Utter a song, arise, Barak, and lead thy captivity captive, thou son of Abin Oam. Then he made him that remaineth have dominion over the nobles among the people, the Lord made me have dominion over the mighty. Out of Ephraim there was a root of them against Amalek. After thee, Benjamin, among thy people, out of Maker came down governors, and out of Zebulun they that handle the pen of the writer. And the princes of Issachar, where with Deborah, even Issachar, and also Barak, he was sent on foot into the valley. For the divisions of Reuben, there were great thoughts of heart. Why abodest thou among the sheepfolds to hear the bleatings of the flocks? For the divisions of Reuben, there were great searchings of heart. Gilead abode beyond Jordan. And why did Dan remain in ships? Asher continued on the seashore and abode in his breaches. Zebulun and Naphtali were a people that jeopardized their lives unto death in the high places of the field. The kings came and fought, then fought the kings of Canaan, in Te'anach, by the waters of Megiddo, and they took no gain of money. They fought from heaven. The stars in their course fought against Sisera. Sisera. The river of Kishon swept them away, that ancient river, the river Kishon, O oh, my soul, thou hast trodden down strength. Then were the horse's hooves broken by the means of the prancings, the prancings of their mighty ones. Curse ye, Miraz, said the angel of Yahuwah. Curse ye bitterly, the inhabitants thereof, because they came not to help, to the help of Yahuwah, to the help of Yahuwah against the mighty. Blessed above woman, Shejael, the wife of Heber, the Kenite, be, blessed shall she, be above women in the tent. He asked water, and she gave him milk. She brought forth butter in a lordly dish. She put her hand to the nail, and her right hand to the workman's hammer. And with a hammer she smote Sisera, and smote off his head, when she had pierced and stricken through his temples. At her feet she bowed, he fell, he laid, at her feet he bowed, he fell, he laid down, at her feet he bowed, he fell, where he bowed, there he fell down dead. <laughs> I love it, man. Oh, continuing here. The mother of Sisera looked out at a widow, window and cried through the lattice, why is the chariot so long in coming? Why tarry the wheels of his chariots? Her wise ladies answered her, Yea, she returned. Answer to herself, They have not, have they not sped? Have they not divided the prey to every man a damsel too? To Sisera, a prey of divers colors, a prey of divers colors of needlework, of divers colors of needlework, 
on both sides meet for the necks of them that take the spoil. So let all thine enemies perish, O Yahuwah, but let them that love him be as the sun when he goeth forth in his might, and the land had rest forty years. You know, I think that uh, when we enter in to the kingdom of heaven, when, and you know, we enter into his kingdom now, but we are the clay mingled with the iron in these days. Yes, Rome is the beast of Rome is very much, much present with us. And we, the clay, the kingdom of God, which Daniel said, I will raise up a kingdom in the days of those kings that will never end. He's building his kingdom now. And we will join all those who went before the Messiah, before uh, he resurrected from the dead, before his death, his crucifixion, his death, and his resurrection. When that last trump sounds, we will rise. The dead will rise first, and then we, who are at, whoever is left at that time, I don't believe that will happen in my lifetime, but many do. I cannot argue them. I don't know the day or the time, but I suppose that I shall follow like all of those before me who died in Messiah did. I will be raised on that day and we will be with him forever. He will set up, he will abolish all the kingdoms of men as foretold. And you can read about that in the, the template for prophecy history and prophecy future. That dream that he gave that great king, the head of gold, Nebuchadnezzar, as interpreted, the, the dream is sure and the interpretation thereof is sure uh, from the mouth of Daniel uh, who got the interpretation from our Heavenly Father, he shall abolish all these kingdoms, all these beasts of men shall be abolished forever. And his kingdom, like a great mountain, depicted by that great mountain, shall fill the whole earth. And when that day comes, we will enjoy his retirement plan. No, we will not retire like the world, sit around and drink beer and watch football games until we're dead, or whatever you do when you're retired go to Pilates classes and exercise classes, trying to get our old bodies to keep working until we finally die. That's a retirement of little hope. But we have a retirement. First, a thousand years where he's going to set up a kingdom and we're going to rule and reign and judge the nations with him for that thousand years. And during that time, I have a notion that there will be a lot of breaking forth into song just like Deborah did here, just broke, broke forth into song, singing of the deeds of men whose hearts followed hard after the Heavenly Father, who followed hard in obedience to them and did great conquest and great things. We will break forth. There will be a lot of breaking forth into songs. And it makes me think of one of my very favorite uh, uh, readings uh, of, of the writings of men and that would be J.R.R. Tolkien and reading of uh, The Hobbit and of course the, and I know a lot of you just seen the movie but you miss a lot because the movie covers so little and it's, the movie has to do it a little differently because they need to speed things up to get it done even though the movie is very long and they're very well done but you miss a lot and, uh, and wh what it reminds me is if they break forth into song just like Deborah did here. And uh, I believe there's going to be a lot of that in the kingdom to come. And what an enjoyable thing it will be. I look forward to seeing as many of you there as possible. Most of you I will never see in this life, but I will see you in that day. All you have to do is cross the border into his kingdom and endure in his kingdom till your mortality ends. Hallelujah. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on Internet or our several affiliates. 
If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for Missionary Radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. Then, when you subscribe, we will send you the last quarterly MP3 CD of that program immediately and continue to do so with each new quarter. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host, cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator, for His holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening.